We are actually uh, Vaughn and Dave and uh, Stephanie and Nick. So um, we're a team of four talking about a project that was a um, really a, a large group effort. Um, my name is Bonnie Stewart. I am in Windsor, Canada. Um, and I will let my other presenters introduce themselves. I'm Dave Cormier. I'm in the closet, uh, or actually in my shed here in Windsor, Canada as well. It's a whole shed here. And I am Stephanie Johnston, and I am one of the students that helped to work on the open page project that we are going to present on. And I'm Nick Baker. I'm uh, also here in Windsor, Canada, just in a different part of the city right now. I'm the director of open learning here, um, so was had uh, had a great time watching these guys work on this this project. So this project uh, started about a year ago. Uh, was funded by our office of open learning and also by our center for teaching and learning. Um, I was the PI of the project, and everyone sort of worked together uh, to to make it come together. Um, I'm going to get Stephanie to introduce the core team of students who did the bulk of the research in the project? Yeah, so there was actually four students and um, we're all in actually, well now we're in our second year, we've almost graduated, so that's exciting. But we joined at the end of our first year. So there was four of us, we all came across uh, different disciplines of what we were teaching and what we were interested in, but we all came together with a common interest to work on this project after being in the digital literacy and media for the classroom course that Bonnie taught. And it was great to have them. And the open learning team. Yeah, so uh, the primary people who worked on this were uh, Cassie Coates is one of our students. She helps with um, media projects. She's a communication media and film student. Um, Mark Lubrick is one of our uh, learning specialists, and he does a lot of support for uh, online multimedia development. And then, of course, Dave works with us now, too, um, and uh, was part of different parts of this project. That's right, and I'm just going to put the link to the project into the chat right now. But what this project um, was, this picture, if I were to ask folks to identify what do you see in this picture here behind the words, throw into the chat, what would you call what you're seeing in front of you? A lecture theater, a lecture, traditional learning space, uncomfortable, a lecture hall. In North America, the term that, that we would probably use more commonly would just be a classroom. Um, bad lighting, one way. It is a particular teaching and learning space that many of us have been acculturated to, but it is a particular type of teaching and learning space that definitely foregrounds kind of one-way broadcast teaching, right, where the, the purpose is content delivery. My background, this course, th this, sorry, this project came out of a um, digital technologies and um, social media course that I taught to Bachelor of Education students in the Faculty of Ed at University of Windsor last year. It was my first year in Windsor. I had the privilege of working with four different classes of students. Um, we were doing all kinds of work with technology, and I wanted to get it beyond that one-way broadcast lecture model of teaching um, and to really encourage students into active learning, participatory pedagogy, and authentic assignments, and in a sense, really open learning. Um, and so to, to try to do that, one of the things that I was realizing is that I wanted to work with the classic idea of Web 2.0, right, where the web is a uh, a world of knowledge abundance that students can contribute to. Um, however, doing that in digital technologies means that they are doing it often on spaces that are problematic or the seven deadly sins. Um, and so balancing that kind of tension, uh, which Dave White and I got to talk about at six in the morning today, um, around 
open pedagogy and sometimes not very open spaces that we have to work on. Um, and yes, good point, Jeff Gallant, some of those spaces, really most of them do have a, a very strong element of wrath in addition to the other sins. Um, so during this course, one of the main assignments was to have students in groups assess different educational technologies and then um, and look at their data implications, right? What does it mean to work with students in these spaces? How can I use them in a classroom and present that back to each other? And I realized as they were doing it that that whole authentic audience element that is so important to open pedagogy, um, I kind of let them down because these assignments were just walled within the classroom. And I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to apply for a little grant and see if we can um, make sort of a, a tool parade, essentially, of short, brief, fun, but well-researched teacher-to-teacher overviews of different tools. Because it's not just my um, pre-service teachers, my teacher candidates in my classes, who would benefit from learning about these tools year after year. Um, it's also my own faculty colleagues. It's the K-12 teachers in our local systems and everywhere. We are all on the same learning curve in the sense that we are constantly faced with all kinds of new tools going, yeah, what am I going to do with this? Um, so I applied for couple of small grants. We created something called Hashtag You Win Tool Parade, which is a series of both short videos and podcasts that live on a page called The Open Page, which is hosted by our Faculty of Ed, and the link is up top. Um, and also, uh, we did professional development sessions for K-12 teachers, which we'll talk about. We are planning parent engagement sessions for year two, in addition to further professional development sessions should we ever go back to school and this past year i also ran a service learning class which in the context of the u uh, the uns or faculty of education means a two-year class um, focused on building um, engagement with a community and our community was essentially the open community using tool, the tool parade as our text so that was sort of the core of what we did. Um, just recently, our university has showcased our, our resources as um, something that they've launched for teaching parent for parents who are teaching their kids at home. But we're, we're happy to have the resources shared and out there. And certainly, because no one was really anticipating um, that suddenly there would be this explosion of online, we hope that these sort of short videos and podcasts are of help to folks who are teaching teaching <laughs> unexpectedly or <laughs> in an unplanned way at home. Um, the open page has, at the moment, 13 videos, about 15 different tools, because two of our videos, one of which we're going to show you, is uh, compare and contrast between two similar, uh, two similar tools. We also have 11 podcasts on another 11 tools. So we've covered, in the end, I think once we finish the last one or two videos, about 28 different tools. Some of them are super critical. Uh, if anyone is a big fan of Prodigy Math or works for Prodigy Math, you, um, you, may, you may not want to watch that video, but we, we were not fans. Um, and we also included some lesson resources in there. Our big focus was twofold. What are the data implications of these given tools? Yesterday, Juliana and I um, Juliana Raffaelli, who I think is here in, in the class, in the, um, in the session, uh, she and I did a little poll with folks about how often we as educators read the terms of service of tools that we use. And basically, we don't. Long story short, we don't. And I don't either, because as I discovered doing this project, they're not meant to be read by actual humans. They're meant to be read by lawyers. And so what one of the key things that we wanted to do was make this accessible to people. What's the skinny on should I use this with my students? And two, how will using this tool potentially help me serve the purpose of equity in my classroom so that I'm doing something for um, the variety of learners that I, I may, whose needs I may want to meet? Um, 
one of the things with data, so Zoom has suddenly become both unprecedentedly popular and also um, more problematic than we realized. But uh, when we did, we did a, a number of the videos, not just with our student team in them, but also some with some of my faculty colleagues in them, because I wanted to encourage faculty to see this project as something that they were involved in. And I figured, hey, folks are probably more likely to check out the site if, um, you know, if they're on it. And so my colleague, Miriam Tolson Murty, seen here was actually the sort of featured talent in our Zoom video. And um, we did notice as we did the research on Zoom that it does this thing called attention tracking. So we featured in our video why there's a problem with this student attention tracker and why that feature shouldn't guide pedagogy, which given the explosion of Zoom, I was pretty happy about. Stephanie, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about the different things that you and the team did um, in, because there are these four students that were mentioned earlier, Stephanie, um, Olivia, Anthony, and Alicia were our core researchers and everything for all the videos that came out. So each one of us actually got to kind of say where we were interested. And there was someone who was in charge of community outreach, someone who was more in charge of the video editing. And then we had someone to work with the faculty. And then there was me. I was in charge of actually researching and writing for the scripts and doing some other academic research. Now, in terms of that question about the whole terms of service thing, that was kind of my job. So I was one of the few people who could say that they've read the terms of service or the privacy policy. And let me tell you, 100%, they are not meant for <laughs> humans to read. I went through and I, I figured out kind of a little bit of a formula to navigate through them. But uh, that was that was my role in the project. And it was it was a huge learning curve to understand how to incorporate that into differentiation and also creating the terms of service in a way that was uh, understandable for the audience we were trying to reach. But we all collaborated together on it and kind of navigated the waters together. And did an amazing job. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen here, if it will let me. Why will it not let me? I'm not sure. Um, hold on. There we go. Um, and can everyone see my screen? I need someone to tell me verbally. Um, I'm just going to very quickly show you a little bit of one of our videos. This is the open You're good. Page. Keep going. Good. Um, this is the open page hosted on the University of Windsor faculty led site. And if you'll see, we have our videos here on the sidebar and then our podcasts below. And just for a quick taste of what the videos are like, we'll show you a short bit of one. I'm going to actually make that large, sorry. Come on, YouTube. Oh, no. Tech can do for you. From the University of Windsor's Faculty of Education, I'm Anthony. And I'm Alicia. And we're setting up for a debate of the ages between Kahoot and Mentimeter. Asking and answering questions is essential to learning and discovery. Both Mentimeter and Kahoot are interactive student response tools. The teacher designs and sets up layouts and formats that allow for open-ended questioning. Mentimeter and Kahoot will generate a six-digit code for a specific session. Both platforms keep the students' names anonymous, which means they choose their own display IDs. These are social learning platforms that can help classes get engaged and give feedback on what they're learning. To use Kahoot, you just sign up for an account, and from there, you can create questions that students can answer. This means that you can create different options for the answers and the students have to select the correct one. You can add in photos, videos, GIFs, and polls for more ways to engage learners. That sounds great and all, but can Kahoot offer in-platform presentation designs like word clouds, reactions, and short answer options? There. So I'm going to take us back to the um, slide deck, but that just gives you kind of a, a, a super quick sense of what the videos were meant to look like. They've got a fairly light tone. Um, they are meant to be something that very quickly goes over what you are um, trying to cover, but gives teachers a sense of how that 
works. And now I think we're back here. What we did once we had created a core number of videos was um, Alicia, who you just saw in the video, started approaching local schools here in Windsor and seeing if we could go in and actually do PD sessions for teachers about this resource. So Dave was actually a support to me in that, and he's going to talk about that briefly. Yeah, that was that was a super fun process. We got a, Steph and I were actually in a school together, so we got a chance to go in, have 30 uh, 40 in some cases people in a room and actually go through trying to do digital practice having the having Stephanie who is a you know an education student come in and actually teach uh, the teachers how to go ahead and do this so we had a lot of fun we did a little bit of mentorship in terms of how to do those presentations and stuff uh, but it was an authentic experience right they got a chance to go into a school to actually inform those teachers what's no way a token process like they were doing deep sort of trying to get them to understand the digital and what that meant. And uh, yeah, it was it was a really great professional development experience for, for me, for the teacher students, and then also for the teachers themselves. And one of the other pieces is um, while the students were, my student team of four, including Stephanie, were building the videos and supporting faculty to build videos um, and doing PD in local schools, as well as sharing stuff in the open, we were also getting my service learning classes, uh, two classes, uh, each with about 25, 30 students off the ground. And those students, those classes were the ones that did the podcasts. So each group of students in the class spent the whole fall term working up to kind of understanding open and then designing a single group podcast, which was recorded in January. So Stephanie's team, um, they did a fair amount of formative feedback to those students and maybe Stephanie you can talk about that and then Nick you can tell us about the the um, actual recording. So in terms of the feedback we gave we were able to take what we learned from the feedback from teachers in our PD sessions as well as taking the learning curve that we went through and learned through from Bonnie and the service learning class to understand what we had just learned. So we were able to kind of continue that cycle and continue helping where we had just been in the learning curve to help the, stu the students get through the same learning curve. So that was a really neat experience and just helping them to understand maybe the language that they didn't know yet because they were year ones and help them develop that to bring into year two. Yeah, and from, uh, from open learning perspective, um, this is kind of a dream project because we had the most motivated people you could possibly imagine working on this. We worked, the students worked really closely with the office. They were, you know, in our space, talking to people, asking questions, asking really good critical questions. Um, they were super prepared. They took advice. And from our kind of perspective, this was one of the best projects I think we've ever worked on. Um, just so much engagement and such a really good, rich outcome from it. One of the things that we did just from a technical perspective was to set up the simplest possible technology that they could use so that they were not distracted by the technology. And most of the students were actually really, really good at um, uh, not being intimidated by any of the technology. They, uh, you know, came in ready to try things out and experiment and play and then do things differently if, if these didn't work. So um, that was you know, pretty spectacular. We also had the opportunity to have conversations about what Creative Commons licensing means and uh, what CC licensing means for them as students. And you know, these are really significant considerations sometimes to, to try and pass out the ethical implications of having student work being CC licensed and being publicly available and being accessible, and and they need to know what those um, uh, what those implications are and make an informed decision. And I, th I hope <laughs> that's what these students did. Um, but and wonderful think, project to work on. The student team and the service learning students. There was an element of considering digital identity. So this group that did a podcast on Khan Academy they chose to showcase their own photos with the Khan Academy podcast link, but other uh, other groups just showed pictures of their shoes or cartoons. So everyone got to make those choices. 
And I encourage you very much to check out the link. I will put it right back in the chat. Sorry, I think we're two minutes over time. Thank you very, very much. And um, I encourage you to go and check out the open page. And thanks again, Nick, for making this happen. And Stephanie and Dave for great work. Thanks very much, Bonnie. That's really, really interesting and informative. Um, if everyone, well, I can see everyone's already giving you a big virtual round of applause, so I don't even need to ask them. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone.